I think humiliation is a very difficult thing to describe, but I think humiliation is when someone tries to bring someone down to their level. They think that you are uh, you are above them and they want to hurt you, humiliate you, bring you down to their level so that you have no more self-respect and that, so that you have you lose the respect you have for yourself and others lose the respect they have for you. Until independence in 1960, the north of Somalia was a British protectorate, British Somaliland. Today, Somaliland is a self-proclaimed republic which is not recognized by the international community or by other Somali leaders. This film has largely been, been produced in this northern part of the country. What we see here are the streets of Hargeisa, the capital. Hargeisa has been bombed and destroyed in 1988 and clear signs of destruction are still visible in the city, although a lot of reconstruction has already been carried out. This is me. I try to dress according to the local traditions. I wear a Somali dress and a headscarf, which I bought the day I arrived. The Sora group wanted to improve health services in the 80s. This is the prison where they were kept in solitary confinement for almost a decade. This is Osman, Dr. Osman Abdi Maigak. I'm a medical doctor. My name is Mohamed Barud Ali. My name is Abdullah Ali, and I've got a good nickname, Olad. My name is Isa Urakte, an engineer. My name is Ahmed Muhammad Madar, a school teacher. The prisoners developed the language through the wall in order to communicate with each other. Uh, most of us were in solitary uh, confinement cells, so and we needed to communicate with each other. Uh, this language, which is similar to the Morse code, started with uh, adjacent people in adjacent cells doing, you know, doing that. Those are two sounds that you can make on a wall. And two friends of ours started uh, making this into an alphabet. Uh, for example, that's an A. B, C, D, E, and a combination of those two sounds make all the way to Z. And uh, we started uh, telling other people in, in the adjacent cells as well. So in, in the morning when the outside door is open, you have a chance, you have a chance to listen to the soldier. Uh, when he goes away, when his footsteps go away, you can stop next to the door and tell your friend that learn the alphabet through the wall, and may, maybe within a day, he will start also communicating with you in the in the language. And the more you use this, the more you, you become uh, faster, faster and an expert in, in the language. And this was one of the most useful things because we could talk to there were three, four doctors among us. Uh, if you felt uh, uh, you were ill, you could talk to the doctor, and he, although he can't give you any medicine, yet it would help you psychologically that you know, the doctor said you are okay, so you'll feel much better. And uh, we talked about anything under the sun. You know, uh, you have no reservations because uh, there is a wall between you, <laughs> so you can talk about anything uh, through the wall. I heard that you read Anna, Anna Karenina. Uh -huh. Yeah, Anna Karenina through the wall. Yeah, so a friend of mine read it through the wall here for me. Yeah, Anna Karenina was a really big book, and uh, yeah, um, we can put it through. Uh -huh. Welcome. Uh, I think the worst experience I had was once I was one of the many times they put me in jail. They put me in jail for things like, uh, uh, for instance, once they said I was planning to escape from the country. 
And I spent six days in jail for that. Now, come on. I mean, why didn't you wait until I tried to escape and then arrest me? Why arrest me from my house and say that I was planning to escape? And they, they put me in jail. And they put me in a, in a cell on my own. But I didn't have a toilet. And right in front of, my of, my, of the place where they, they put me, there was a big toilet. And it had no doors. And there was the cell next to me was full of men, of criminals, of thieves, and I don't know, just, just men all behind the bars. And uh, so I, I called out and I said, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I need to go and use the bathroom. And uh, that's after I had been the first lady of the country. And they said, well, you want to use the bathroom? There's the bathroom. You use everybody's bathroom. There, you're not better than the others. There's the bathroom they use. And I thought, how can I go and use a bathroom with no doors, facing a cell full of men, full of criminals and people who were, you know. And I just came out of my cell and I just looked at those men and I said, listen, I am going to use that bathroom. And would you be watching your mother or your sister if she was using a toilet and she had no door? Is this the kind of men you are that you would watch a woman using a bathroom? And they said, no. And the first one said, they turned around and they made everybody in the cell turn the other way until I finished using the bathroom. And that was one of the most emotional moments of my time. And the police were so shocked because they couldn't get their objective. They couldn't get me to be humiliated and using a bathroom with all these men watching and shouting at me. So that's another form of resistance and resistance, resisting humiliation. Women and children live in the countryside, which is also being called the interior. Livestock is the pride and resource of Somali pastoralists. Much of this livestock is traditionally being exported to the Arab countries. Somalia does not only consist of the major six clan families who are mostly pastoralists, but also of so-called minorities. These minorities are occupationally specialized caste-like groups, shoemakers, metal workers, barbers, etc. They are outcasts. These minorities suffer constant humiliation. I'm German of the Malian minority community in the refugee camp, Kakuma K. This group are, I can say that they are one of the most unfortunate communities in the, in the world because they are the only occupational group, uh, one of the only occupational groups in Somalia who make shoes and, or metal workers or thread weavers or barbers. Mm -hmm. Yet, and because, and because of this occupation, they are humiliated. Mm -hmm. The reward of, the, of, the, of their contribution to society mm -hmm. became humiliation. Mm -hmm. The Somalis have been have experienced it with foreigners for most of the past century and they have been abused and dominated and insulted and humiliated by foreigners on so many occasions and generally the Somalis are proud people it is and many foreigners find it very difficult really to 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 see that that, that there are non westerners who can be really proud. Today, we are, the world is running to, into the global village where everyone has a share of responsibility to the community, where color is, or religion is, taboos, or nationalities plays anymore that role that has divided before 
these brothers, these communities of the same village. I think that economically, politically, any country could no longer is able to stand alone. The property belongs to all. The international community should, is usually the one that, that encourages dictators and, and, and oppressors like that to progress. Uh, without mentioning any names, uh, I mean, you have uh, government dictators uh, who have millions and billions of dollars in banks. Uh, those billions of dollars were not generated through a salary that they earned or a reward that they were given by the people they were heading. That Those billions came from money that belonged to the people. That was given by the international community. And the international community should act intelligently and fairly and honestly and not feed, not allow oppressors to accumulate so much of the people's money. I think the, the uh, international world has different standards. It, it, it preaches um, human rights and fairness and so on in literature in Europe. But then when that humiliation and when that aggression and when that hurt is taking place in a poor, remote, developing country like Somaliland, uh, nobody wants to be bothered. Let them stew in their own juice. So uh, the international community is, uh, is to blame and I, I hope you have very strong cupboards in which you can lock up your, your conscience uh, because all the civilians who died here died of bombs that were manufactured by people in a developed country. And uh, those poor kids and those poor women and those civilians were not military, they were not people who had done anything other than be born in a particular place in a geographical location, period. That was their crime. That was the crime they were being punished for, that they were being humiliated for. <laughs> Thank you.